This is BBC World. Now we bring you personal in-depth views of an international figure in profiles. National emergency procedures. In 1972, Britain was gripped by industrial unrest. For a general strike if the men Working in an Oxford laboratory at the time was a young biologist who was forced to abandon his research because of the power cuts. He turned to writing instead and began to draft a book that was to kickstart an intellectual revival in evolutionary biology, the study of how life has evolved. The book was The Selfish Gene, the writer Richard Dawkins. It asked a crucial question, where does natural selection act? Is it on species, on groups, on individual animals, or at a more basic level still? It was to prove controversial. It gave this spine-tingling feeling about how you could suddenly see a, a, a pattern in the way animals and human beings behaved uh, that, really, that really hung together and that was really a very exciting new way of looking at the world. When you're talking about genes as though they had intentions and, and minds and you were, were, were consciously selfish, that could mislead. I have very little sympathy with that view. I don't think the phrase selfish gene ever confused a biologist. It only confuses philosophers. But confusing philosophers is exactly what Richard Dawkins seems to do so well. The selfish gene stirred up a hornet's nest of controversy about the meaning of life that's buzzing to this day. And he seems to relish his role as a stirrer, never happier it seems than when he's being an evangelist for strict science or putting a bomb under established religion. His latest book carries on that tradition, setting the clever scientific cat among the parish pigeons. And it might almost have been named for him a devil's chaplain. Today, I'm going to find out if he really does have horns. The Selfish Gene was written 27 years ago. Interestingly, Dawkins, now an Oxford professor, says it's the least favorite of his books. Richard. Hello, come here. <laughs> Thanks very much. Good to see you. Maybe that's because it landed him in so much hot water. People who didn't read beyond the title thought he was suggesting that selfishness among animals, and even among humans, was natural. I guess it's the word selfish, really, isn't it? Do you ever feel that your work has been misrepresented, that you've been fundamentally misunderstood? I suppose everybody's work is sometimes misrepresented. Uh, I certainly have almost unbelievably met the misunderstanding of the selfish gene that genes are, are, are somehow thought to be consciously selfish little entities um, people have seriously thought that I must have been saying that DNA molecules actually think it out and work out how to be selfish the selfish gene is not the same as the selfish individual Charles Darwin said that life evolves through natural selection, that life is a perpetual struggle in which only the strongest succeed. The rest die without bearing offspring. Darwin called it the survival of the fittest, and it worried even him, because it suggested that nature was fundamentally brutal. Dawkins' idea was that it wasn't individuals who were selfish so much as their genes. But coming as it did in the emerging greed is good culture that would dominate the 1980s, the selfish gene appeared to bestow a biological blessing on greed and individualism. Ironically, it was actually opening the door to the opposite, altruism. Dawkins is sometimes associated with selfishness because of the, the phrase, the selfish gene. In fact, what he was doing was making room in evolution for unselfishness. The message of the selfish gene is not that humans are selfish or, or that they ought to be. Um, rather, it's that genes are selfish. And the consequence of genes being selfish, of course, they don't think it out, but the consequence of genes behaving as if they are selfish, self-replicating, self-preserving entities is that humans, or bats or birds, which are survival machines for those genes, are probably going to be not selfish or may well be not selfish. Before Dawkins came along, Darwinism had a problem. If life is a struggle for survival, 
If we're all just trying to reproduce at everyone else's expense, then why would anyone ever be nice to anyone else, as is often seen among wild animals? Why isn't it all just brutal chaos? Altruism was a problem that baffled Darwin um, and baffled scientists really for, for, for most of the 20th century in the sense that um, if evolution consists of a struggle to survive, then why be nice to someone? Um, why, uh, you know, why, why be nice to your potential competitors? Um, and the genes I view transforms this problem because it enables you to say, well, you may indeed be helping the body of uh, another individual survive, um, but in doing so, you may be helping copies of your own genes survive. And that's what happens if you're nice to close relatives, like social insects are, or indeed like we are when we're nice to our children. It was actually the great biologist Bill Hamilton who made the breakthrough discovery about altruism in nature. He noticed that many social insects, like ants and termites, will make the ultimate self-sacrifice, will give up their own lives to save the colony. But the colony is made up entirely of siblings, usually sisters, and the siblings are all genetically identical. So even if one dies, her genes will carry on. Indeed, according to this view, the individual animal becomes almost irrelevant to the selfish drive of its genes. Unfortunately, Hamilton's pioneering work was full of impenetrable maths. It lay largely ignored for several years. It takes a lot of people to make a scientific revolution. Um, you need the uh, people with the, the bright idea, the breakthrough. You need the experimentalists who go out into the field and collect the data that supports it. Um, in Darwin's case, they sort of both came together in, in Darwin. But even Darwin needed a Thomas Henry Huxley to, to, to go out there and, and um, uh, hammer home the point and, and translate it into words that, that other people could understand. In some ways, Richard Dawkins is the Tom Huxley of, of the Hamilton Revolution, if you like. History will, I think, record that, that his, his great significance was to spell out the implications of what people like Hamilton were saying, and perhaps even to Hamilton himself spell out the implications of what he was saying. The main thrust was the idea that animals share genes with their relatives. So if I do something for my brother, let's say, um, then the genes that cause me to do it will survive in him. And so th there's a kind of, there is essentially a gene-centered process going on. Um, Hamilton didn't say anything as simple as that, but that's really the essential idea. Dawkins' real achievement was to make Bill Hamilton's work understandable to the general public. But in science, every solution poses new problems. Selfish genes may explain why one individual will make a sacrifice for a relative who shares its genes, but it doesn't explain selfless behavior beyond that intimate circle. Are animals only prepared to make sacrifices for the sake of near relatives? Humans are animals too, says biology. And in human society, we see plenty of self-sacrifice for the sake of complete strangers. Firemen will even give up their lives for someone they've never met. So, are humans an exception to the idea of selfish genes? I think when applied to, well, for example, trying to understand altruism in bees and wasps and ants and so on, why do worker bees sacrifice themselves for the hive and so on, I think it's the only theory we have. It's the only game in town. Um, when it comes to explaining human altruism, then it manifestly isn't. The second hereditary system, the cultural one in which we teach people ideas and so on, is as important or more important uh, in determining how people behave than, than, than ju just their genetics. The human brain provides possibly the only departure, the only engine of departure from Darwinian principles, and it really does, and, and you can easily, I mean, the simple example is contraception. You're contradicting the Darwinian dictates every time you use a contraceptive. So it, it's easy enough to do. Darwinian natural selection puts into our brains mechanisms that cause us to feel pleasure from sex. Uh, in nature, feeling pleasure from sex is a sufficient guarantee that we shall reproduce. 
by using contraceptives, we can contradict the Darwinian dictate by getting the pleasure without the reproduction. A very, very anti-Darwinian thing to do. Um, we are using the pleasure mechanisms that Darwinian natural selection has built into our brains, and we're using those pleasure mechanisms at the expense of the ultimate Darwinian purpose, which is gene reproduction. In his most recent book, A Devil's Chaplain, Dawkins plays with a famous quotation from Darwin to hint that nature's ruthless cruelty is a kind of devil's brew, a hell on earth that only humans can rise above. A Devil's Chaplain comes from a quotation of uh, a letter that Darwin wrote to his friend Hooker in 1856. Um, Darwin says, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horridly cruel works of nature. Nature really is red in tooth and claw. Nature, the world of Darwinian natural selection, is a pretty nasty environment in which to live. And as a human being, I very strongly advocate that if we understand Darwinism, we should understand it as an object lesson in how not to live, in how not to conduct our lives. It's a lesson in how life came into being, including human life, but it's also a lesson in how we should not behave when organizing our own societies, our own politics, our own morals. So, the devil's chaplain might conclude, stand tall, bipedal ape. The shark may outswim you, the cheetah outrun you, the swift outfly you, the capuchin outclimb you, the elephant outpower you, the redwood outlast you. But you have the biggest gifts of all, the gift of understanding, the ruthlessly cruel process that gave us all existence, the gift of revulsion against its implications, the gift of foresight, something utterly foreign to the blundering short-term ways of natural selection and the gift of internalizing the very cosmos. Internalizing the cosmos? If you didn't know Dawkins was an atheist, you might think he was a deeply spiritual man. Maybe he's both. But he's certainly a stickler for logic and rationality. He believes only science can enable us to discover truths about the world, there's no room for a creator here, no room for a grand designer, as he made abundantly clear in his 1991 Royal Society Christmas Lectures. This is a flatfish, a halibut. Its ancestors once swam normally in the water like a normal fish does, like that. But the ancestors of the halibut settled down on the bottom of the sea, one side down. They lay on the bottom of the sea, and then now a modern flatfish moves along like that. You've probably seen them doing it. But when it did that, the ancestor found that one of its eyes was looking straight into the sand. Only the other one was looking up. And so gradually in evolution, the other eye, the one that was looking into the sand, migrated round the side of the head and came up to the top, with the result that the skull of the halibut is now an extremely distorted object. Now, anybody who was going to design a flatfish wouldn't do it that way. You'd do it like a skate, which is another kind of shark, which is also a flatfish, and it flattened itself, its ancestors flattened itself, by going onto its belly, so that both its eyes were looking upwards, and it had no need to do any kind of distortion. But by some kind of historical accident, the ancestors of the halibut and the soul and the place all did it by lying on their side, and that meant that they had this distortion. So this is an imperfection in design which is just the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had evolved, but is very much not the kind of thing you'd expect to see if these creatures had been created. This question of design is crucial. We all know by simply looking at a clock that it had a designer, a maker. There's no way it could have just sprung into existence all on its own. So many people look at life on Earth and say, surely it too must have had a designer. Dawkins thinks not. In his book, The Blind Watchmaker, Dawkins argues that life is the result of blind chance, of random genetic mutation and natural selection over millions of years. God is simply unnecessary. What I wonder is, 
whether you're being a little bit unfair on religion, surely it also serves a really crucial purpose in terms of creating a code of conduct, a, a, a code of ethics, that if we are going to do as you ask, to contradict our genes, to act against our genes, we really do need guidance as to how we treat each other. Isn't that the role that religion in practice plays? It seems to me that the enterprise of science is to try to understand and that injecting a supernatural intelligence as a device for explaining something, as a device for kidding yourself that you understand, is really to inject something that defeats the object of the whole exercise. We are trying to understand what's going on, the mechanism, the, the cogwheels that are actually causing the, the world of life or whatever it is to be the, the way it is. I'm all for codes of conduct, I'm all for codes of morals, I'm all for um, moral philosophy, ethical philosophy, um, political codes, legal codes, which guide our lives and which are probably not directly following from any kind of scientific principles. I'm all for that. If you want to call that religion, then that's your privilege. I would not call it religion because I think it's misleading because to me religion carries a whole lot of other baggage which is not moral philosophy, not legal codes, uh, not codes of conduct, but which is belief in the supernatural. The late Douglas Adams told a nice story and I think I've quoted it in A Devil's Chaplain. There was a man who didn't understand how television sets worked. He thought that there were a lot of little men inside the television sets who were jumping up and down, pulling sort of cardboard cutouts or something, in, in, in some way anyway, controlling the image on the screen. So an engineer explained to him that actually, no, what happens in a television set is you've got cathode ray tube and you've got scan lines and, and all that sort of stuff. And he, he um, fully explained it to this chap how television sets worked. And he said, oh, yes, hmm. Yes, I understand. I, now I, under, I finally, now I understand how a television set works. But I expect there are just a few little men in there, aren't there? Richard is one of the most spiritual people that I know. This might sound surprising. I mean it, of course, entirely in a non-religious sense. But his feeling of awe and wonder and humility um, in the face of, of the natural world is, is something I, I, I feel can only be described as spiritual. If you are a lover of truth, then it's very painful to see people's minds being fettered by ideas based purely on tradition and on faith and on revelation to an individual which is then passed on through sacred texts and a whole ream of disciplines and, and, and uh, prayers and so on and all that builds up out of it. And Richard feels very deeply against that kind of fettering of the mind, especially the, the poisoning of children's minds at an early age um, when they will accept anything and everything. Does science spoil our love of nature? Dawkins would say emphatically, no. Our understanding of how the world works actually enhances our appreciation of it. His book, Unweaving the Rainbow, got its title from a poem by Keats, asking for the secrets of nature to remain as secrets and not be explained and demystified. The book, like so much of his writing, is peppered with literary allusions and poetic references and begs the question, is there something unique about him as a science writer? I do think that um, uh, he did, in a way, inaugurate a new tradition of science writing. But I also think he will be seen as, as part of uh, the revolution in evolutionary biology that came to bring the gene-centered view into evolutionary biology and made a huge difference in that respect as well. So uh, I think he genuinely crosses the two cultures between art and, and science as, as a contributor in both. Richard Dawkins is now working on his next book, a further exploration of evolution, another work of popular science. Explaining it to me, I found him yet again drawn to poetic and even religious words and expressions. It's a history of life written as a pilgrimage to the past, a pilgrimage to the origin of life, a pilgrimage to retrace your ancestors all the way back to the origin of life. The notion of pilgrimage 
has Chaucerian echoes, obviously. And the book is becoming more and more Chaucerian, the way I'm seeing it. It's the ancestor's tale. Um, there are tales told by pilgrims. The pilgrims are species of animal or plant on the kind of shared pilgrimage back to the origin of life. The pilgrims don't all set out together as Chaucer's do. Rather, they set out and they join the pilgrimage successively. So we set out and we are joined six million years into the past by the chimpanzee pilgrims. And then another million years into the past, we're joined by the gorilla pilgrims. And then we're joined at 14 million years in the past by the orangutan pilgrims and so on. Pilgrimage, chaplain, cosmos. I came away from my meeting more confused than enlightened. The stickler for science who loves religious imagery. The man who seeks morality yet hates faith. Like a moth to a flame, he seems endlessly drawn to the very things, spiritual and irrational, that he says he hates. Since the selfish gene was first published, the world of evolutionary biology has moved on. Some scientists now believe there's more altruism in nature than Dawkins suggested, that animals can be nice to each other in wider groups, not just among the immediate family. We now think that there may be other ways in which cooperative behavior can, can evolve, partly by group selection, where, where uh, um, individuals do things uh, uh, which benefit the group, don't benefit themselves, and don't benefit their relatives either, and they expect nothing back for it. There is irony here. Richard Dawkins, the man who insists nature is brutal, exhorts us humans to treat each other well to deny our selfish genes. But that's exactly what the world's religions that he hates with such passion do too. They ask us to treat each other as if we were brothers. Meanwhile, scientists seem to be finding evidence that animals cooperate, do things for their mutual benefit beyond the strict confines of the immediate family. I wonder if we're all heading in the same direction. Maybe we humans with our quirky religions are just as natural in our behavior as the other animals. Maybe our selfish genes have programmed our huge brains to be unselfish in an even wider sense than Richard Dawkins ever imagined. Far from having horns, I ended up thinking that Richard Dawkins was probably growing a halo, but he wouldn't thank me for saying that. 